Hello, hello, hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Rob Lee. I'm the Chief Curriculum Director here at the SANS Institute. Uh, formerly used to run the uh, DFER curriculum and uh, co-authored uh, Forensics 500, Windows Forensics, and Forensics 508, Advanced Instant Response. Well, we have an amazing uh, show here today. Um, I am super excited uh, to talk about uh, one of my favorite uh, pastimes in really trying to get into this stuff right next to cloud is getting into open source intelligence, um, what it means, what it does, and you know how it can impact your cybersecurity career. Everyone needs to be doing uh, much better open source intelligence. There's so much information that is widely available to any individual doing an investigation in any type of incident that you could potentially investigate online. So today, uh, our special guest is a very good friend of mine, Matt Edmondson, and Matt, is the, what I call the dark knight of OSINT. Uh, he is one of these individuals that uh, when you start talking to him, uh, he's the nicest guy on the planet. Uh, he honestly has the approach of a big teddy bear, um, completely lovable. But when he starts talking about some of the capabilities of what he's able to do with open source intelligence and how it impacts uh, people's cybersecurity careers and what you're doing in your investigations, it is eye-opening. It is much better than anything you find on TikTok these days, uh, and I can't wait uh, to get into that segment. Uh, you notice on the uh, screen on the right-hand side that there is a quick Slido poll uh, that we just put up. This Slido poll basically is going to allow interactions with uh, the uh, community out there. The question that we're prompting you with initially is, in a few words, you know, the first gut reaction when someone says, oh, a sin, your brain says what? What do you immediately think about? Um, you know, I know there's a lot of uh, memes out there regarding OSN, uh, you know, regarding Google and that kind of thing, but I'm really kind of curious, like when you think about OSN, what is that initial gut reaction, uh, even emotion, what does it mean to you, uh, anything in there, and go ahead and uh, type in your answers in here, and the word cloud will start to populate, and Matt and I are going to start uh, talking about some of these answers uh, once we start our segment uh, in just a few minutes. Um, Wait Just uh, InfoSec is a weekly podcast, and I'm really glad to be the guest host again. Uh, Sands is doing an incredible job keeping everyone up to date with the latest news, latest trends, latest um, things that everyone out there in the cybersecurity community should know. Uh, starting off uh, with every uh, Wait Just InfoSec, we do go through the current news, uh, and I'd like to go ahead and transition over to Michelle uh, Peterson, who's going to be introducing our latest News Bites segment. So Michelle, can you take it away? Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Wait Just an InfoSec News Bites. I'm SANS contributing editor and your host, Thomas Wolf, bringing you your need to know cybersecurity news of the week. We have some great stories for you today, folks. We are going to be talking about a newly discovered zero day vulnerability, we have a story about a backdoor affecting millions of PC motherboards. And in our last story, we talk about a clever, if not insidious, new mage card style skimmer attack. So with that, let's jump right in. A zero day vulnerability in the move it transfer manage file transfer software is being actively exploited to steal data. The critical SQL injection flaw can be exploited to allow database access without authentication. Progress Software released fixes for supported versions of Move It Transfer and Move It Cloud. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency added the vulnerability to its known exploited vulnerabilities catalog. If you just heard the term zero day and actively exploited and aren't pushing this patch to the top of your priority list, you're doing it wrong. Next up. The Taiwanese manufacturer Gigabyte released BIOS updates to mitigate a backdoor vulnerability in 271 different models of their motherboards. That puts the number of affected motherboards in the millions. 
Researchers at Eclipsium detected the back door, which exists in the unified extensible firmware interface. When PCs with vulnerable motherboards boot up, a Windows binary is executed and invisibly launches an updater program that downloads and executes a payload. And while researchers don't think that the back door was added with malicious intent and instead was due to sloppy work, that sloppy work will likely damage Gigabyte's reputation for a long time to come. And finally, researchers at ECME have detected a mage cart style campaign to steal credit card data and personally identifiable information from websites. The attacks are targeting Magento, WooCommerce, WordPress, and Shopify environments. What makes this different from a mage cart campaign is that this scheme comprises web compromises websites, turning them into temporary command and control servers that can then distribute card skimming malware to other websites. Now, this attack employed several other clever techniques to evade detection, such as using base 64 to obfuscate the host URL, structuring the build to resemble popular third-party services, using JavaScript code as loaders to fetch the attack code, and flagging the browser to ensure the same information isn't stolen twice. And those are your SANS News Bites for this week. For more critical cybersecurity news and commentary from some of the sharpest minds in InfoSec, don't forget to subscribe to the SANS News Bites newsletter, your twice weekly summary and analysis of the most significant cybersecurity developments. You can do that at sans.org backslash news bites. Thanks again. I'm your host for this week, Michelle Peterson. Hoping to see you next time. All right, welcome back. Um so just a couple notes. Uh, cup coming up uh, next month in July is my favorite uh, event of the year. Uh, that is a training event that SANS puts on annually um, called SANS Fire. Uh, SANS Fire is a very unique event. It's one of the first core three uh, events that SANS has ever had. Now, I'm looking over in the comments. Everyone is you know, announcing where they're from. So you know, continue doing that and also engage on the Slido poll. But quick trivia question. Does anyone know what the acronym for SANS FIRE stands for? F-I-R-E. It was originally an acronym. I don't think many people know this, but this goes back to legacy almost 20 years now. I'm just kind of curious if anyone remembers what the FIRE in SANS FIRE actually stands for. Uh, and so we'll come back to at least see if anyone's able to get that answer. But in the meantime, I'd like to introduce my personal friend, Dr. Johannes Ulrich, who's going to be talking about SANS FIRE and some of the cool things that's going to be occurring at the event and his keynote. Hello, my name is Johannes Ulrich. I'm the Dean of Research for the SANS Technology Institute. And one of the things that's uh, sort of my favorite uh, SANS event each year, of course, is SANS Fire. Because at SANS Fire, we are featuring the Internet Storm Center. And uh, one thing that I really want to point out here is that we have this keynote at SANS Fire. And what we want to talk about here is, well, how do we actually get all the data? How do we, for example, know about, uh, let's just look at a couple of the things that we had sort of last year, efile.com. Efile.com was compromised two weeks before April 15th, the tax filing deadline here in the United States. So we covered that. We talked about how the malware worked. When uh, Silicon Valley Bank uh, went out of business, we tracked some of the scams as they emerged just sort of a day or so after uh, the event really happened and uh, people learned about the failure. Remember also those .zip domains, we talked about them. But then we also have some great articles, like, for example, all this malware analysis stuff that Didier and Xavier usually put together. Didier writes about a lot of the tools that he wrote himself and that everybody is, of course, using in order to analyze malware. So if you want to learn more about where we get all of our data from, how can you participate? How can you help us and how can you learn in doing so, in participating, for example, in our Honeypot network? Well, uh, we'll talk about that during the keynote on Tuesday, Sands Fire. You see it here on our website, it's uh, July 10th through 15th. Uh, 
Hope to see you there. Hope to introduce you to some of the great people like uh, Didi Xavier and some of the handlers here uh, that uh, help us really make this site so great, so current and so educational. Thank you. All right, and we're going to be bringing up our uh, core segment with uh, our interview with Matt Edmondson. But our trivia question, uh, a lot of people were very, very close on this one. The trivia question is, what does the FIRE and SANS FIRE actually uh, stand for? Uh, FIRE, um, SANS FIRE's first event occurred in 2002 up in Boston, Massachusetts. And the FIRE acronym was something that I created, Forensics, Instant Response, and Education. And Education, so th that's where it came from. Uh, we don't really use that anymore. Sands Fire is kind of stuck on its own, but uh, that's where the original uh, acronym actually came from. So little known facts that Al, you know, and as we know, knowing's half the battle. Matt, where are you? Let's talk. Let's chat. Hey, I'm here. Hey, I'm here. He here. First things know, first, Rob, do you have any idea how many messages I've got over the past couple of days congratulating me on the new Dark Knight title? <laughs> saying that they switched my names and the contacts. So I, I owe you, buddy. I owe you. <laughs> Well, I do. I do think it's uh, appropriate. I'm I'm kind of a comic book nerd with the stuff behind me. Um, and before we get into it, I'm I'm a little bit fascinated with all that stuff that's behind you. You're obviously a baseball fan, so you know, point out yeah, you know, what just a couple of those items behind you, so the audience knows. Uh, that's uh, what a Ty Cobb signed check, a few other baseballs and stuff over there, and then the most important stuff. You always got to have bourbon within arm's reach, so that way if things start going <laughs> really really bad, it's just that I don't actually get get up from the chair. That's amazing. Um, what is the cube? What is the cube? It's actually a light. It's off right now because it looks kind of funky, but it uh, it's just like this light. It's carved into it. It's a solid piece of a uh, stone, but then it's got like a little light inside. It's really cool. And of course, I'm a nerd too. It always reminds me of a Borg cube. Yeah, I was going to say the Borg cube. That's in, uh, just you know, yep. to assimilate everything. All right. So open source intelligence. We're going to go ahead and pull up the poll and see where everyone's landing on this. And right. kind of curious, you know, like before we dive into this with with you, is like OSINT is, you know, kind of across the board. Um, you know, the word cloud here, and again, you, you still have a chance to throw your stuff into the word cloud. But, uh, you know, Matt, you know, when you're looking at this, is, is this surprising to you when, you know, when you're initially talking about OSINT when you're trying to describe it to people? No, not at all. It's kind of funny too. One of my favorite things is when people show up for a class and it's like, oh no, I've never done any OSINT before. Like, BS, how did you find out about the class? Right. We all do OSINT every day in our lives, but so many more businesses now we're realizing that they need it. And I'm fascinated constantly with people telling me what they're doing OSINT. A friend of mine who's kind of very big in the OSINT industry, a huge part of her job right now, and she's self-employed, is basically researching property. And I'm like, what? And she's actually providing consulting on people who want to buy property. And it's like, oh, I want to buy some property outside of this city. She'll look, see who else is buying property around there and be like, oh, hey, well, these people bought this land over here. And three times when they've done that in the past in other cities, they've ended up like turning it into a beautiful area, putting in a Whole Foods, doing all this stuff. So you should buy around there. And it's just, it's mind boggling of like the different ways that people are doing OSINT. It's all over the place. Yeah, looking at this data leak, um, easy access for cyber criminals. And, you know, that's something that's interesting, which I'd like to get into is like, you know, uh, those with great power have great responsibility as the, uh, the saying goes. But, you know, the idea that this information that's available online is available to anyone. Yeah. So it can be used for both good and evil. And, and comment on that. I'm interested. No, absolutely. It's a, a lot of times I kind of describe it as the uh, the seedy underbelly of the internet because there's a lot more information, frankly, on the internet than there is in the dark web. And sometimes you have to go to the dark web and that can be annoying and has its own special set of challenges. But so many times like I hang out in, in those areas just to see what's going on. It's important to be aware of it because, you know, things happen and information gets leaked out. I think back to what was it about two years ago now, the Qualys breach and Qualys didn't do anything wrong. There was the vulnerability and something else. But all of a sudden now organizations were hearing there was rumors of, hey, there was vulnerability scans of Qualys clients sitting there on the dark web, right? And reaching out to me like, hey, do you have a copy of this? Can you get a copy of this? We want to see what our exposure is, right? And so trying to go and deal with some of these different things just to analyze and see once the data is out there, it, uh, it really helps you to understand what's out there. So, you know, to protect against it. Another one I remember during uh, 
COVID in 2020, there was something called Blue Leaks. Some of you may remember it was 262 gigabytes of law enforcement information that was leaked out. A lot of people's personal contact information, their work contact information, and once again, just trying to gobble all of that and deal with that large data set to let agencies and individuals know what their exposure was. And so absolutely, breach data is a tricky thing because I understand some people, that's ah, immoral to kind of look at or try to collect, but I kind of always had the viewpoint of it's out there. The criminals are using it. Like I at least want to know what's out there so we can know what we need to protect against. So, I mean, it, this is the hard part about OSN is like, it's all over the place, but you know, how do you define it in a more of a box for, you know, why would an organization want to invest into a skill set that includes OSN? And is it a separate career or is it a skill set that everyone should have? You know, those two things. I'm kind of curious. Yes, no, it's absolutely a skill set that everyone should have. I mean, it really is like just the different things that I do over the course of a month, right? Financial and merger, like merger and acquisition due diligence, you know, kind of analyzing infrastructure, certain things like that. And things are, I talk about it in the class a little bit, and I've talked about it before when I've spoke, things are all kind of blended together now. I see law enforcement people that don't consider themselves technical that are all of a sudden researching IP addresses, trying to figure out, is this a VPN? Is this this? Or is this actually where the person lives? And then I've seen people, I remember there was uh, some Twitter code that I wrote for persistent monitoring to alert me if anything met criteria. And I wrote that for my personal use. And I wrote that for when I was still with the government to try to keep an eye on certain things. But then during 2020 here in the US, when we had civil unrest, I know of multiple Fortune 500 companies that were running that code, and I didn't find out about it till after the fact, trying to monitor like, hey, is it safe for our people to go into this building? Or we've had people in this building for 14 hours now, but they don't feel like it's safe to leave. And so you see people, it's all kind of blending together, right? And everyone is just kind of doing, there's really no, oh, well, I'm doing OSIN. I'm in this, but there's still a lot of that, but once again, everyone's so I think it's very, very important to be well-rounded and there's really no one that can't benefit from having OSINT as one of their skill sets because there's, it sounds so dumb, but there's so much information out there. You know, I just retired from the government last year, but I was an agent for almost 22 years. And you think like, oh, the government knows everything. No, it's a lot of times it feels like we know almost nothing, right? There's so much more information on the internet and it just, it behooves you to get very, very good at searching that, finding that and dealing with what you find. Well, let's talk about that real quick. You you just mentioned you retired from the government and I'm, I'm not sure how much you're able to dive into that, you know, specifically what we did, but how did you get here? How are you the dark knight of OSINT? And I know I, I gave you that moniker, that's what happens. Uh -huh. I have my own phone that someone else gave me, but we're not gonna talk about that one. The, so you're in open source intelligence, you have this background, you have this experience, and now you're teaching this class on it. You know, why you, how do you have this background in deep, deep technical skill? How did you get here? It's kind of crazy. I, I grew up very, very poor. And so I didn't really go to college. I went to two years of community college because in California, if you're an orphan, they'll basically pay you to go to community college. And, but then I started working for the government very, very young because it was a stable career, but I, I wasn't technical at all. You know, I didn't, I wasn't afraid of it and I was good with it, but I didn't have like that strong background, but I would see things around the office that needed to be done. And back then it was really cool. We had these things called bookstores and I would go down to the bookstore and buy a book on like databases or something else and read it and then come back into work and just do what needed to be done. And it wasn't my job. It was just, if I don't do it, we're not going to have this capability. And after doing that for a few months, it just kind of a the word kind of spreads. You start helping people around and doing some kind of cool things, I think. And I got a phone call one day and they said, hey, do you want to come up here and be an intelligence agent and just kind of focus on some of this more technical work? And I'm like, yeah. So I was doing a lot of stats, maps, analysis, certain things like that. But I developed a very, very strong interest in digital forensics. And at that time, they said, hey, we're not going to pay you for any training. You have to pay for everything out of pocket. And I started researching. And that's when I first found out about SANS. So I started taking different courses, teaching myself, got to the point where I felt very comfortable with forensics. I've done forensics on over a thousand devices, testified in court numerous times, all that type of stuff. And then I started to get an interest in kind of incident response, right? Kind of like the next level of forensics. But it was just the way my mind worked of teaching myself and going to these different classes and not wanting to skip over intermediate steps. 
I wanted to, I felt like I needed to learn how to hack before I learned for evidence of people hacking. And so that's when I did the same thing. I started taking, once again, the SANS courses on pen testing, right? Going to Black Hat, taking courses on exploit development, grabbing my OSCP and getting to the point where I was very, very well-rounded. And as I started doing more offensive style work, you just like uh, the biggest step is reconnaissance, right? It's gathering up all of this information. That's what drives everything else you're doing. And it sounds so kind of uh, obvious in hindsight, but as I was doing more and more of this automation to gather information, I'm like, God, there's so much of this that could apply that could help out in my day job, right? And the different analysts and the agents that I work with every single day. And so I wrote a, a white paper calling for the formation of, listen, we should probably get develop an OSINT cell and probably develop a team doing this style of work. And I shot it up the chain of command and I never thought I would hear anything back. And then like a week later, they said, yep, yeah, nope, we read this, we agree, we think it's a great idea and we're pulling you out of forensics to do it. So it wasn't even necessarily my intent to kind of run it, but that's where I ended up. And then uh, things just kind of exploded from there. So it was a weird, that's weird, long roundabout way to get there, but I'm glad where I ended up. Yeah, this is completely amazing because a lot of times, a lot of people find themselves in a career field that you know was not their plan. You know, <laughs> oh, it's just very rewarding for whatever you bring yeah. in it. It really, really, truly is. I remember it's so funny. The first time I um, taught the new OSINT class that we wrote, I um, my TA was laughing one afternoon, and the reason is they said that they got a comment from someone, and they said it is clear that you know Matt had pen testers in mind when he wrote this class. And literally oh, yeah. within an hour later, they got another comment from someone said, man, it's clear that Matt had forensics professionals in mind when he wrote this class. <laughs> and it was laughing. It's like, I didn't even have either in mind. It's just all this stuff. And I'm telling how it's helped me in my career in these problems. The entire class is all problems that I've run into in the private sector, in the public sector, whatever it is, and how we kind of solved them. So. So we're going to go ahead and throw up our second poll because what you're just talking about there is directly tied to this, which is, you know, you just mentioned penetration testing, offensive operations and cyber investigations. So, you know, this is again for the audience, you know, in a few words, write out the type of engagements you use OSIN for um, currently. And it, it could be pen testing, could be, um, you know, you name it, you know, the types of things you might be using. I was kind of curious where this stands, but, you know, Matt, in the meantime, while they're filling that out, I have a question for you, and I'm, I'm wondering if you could, if if there's one thing you could say, everyone should go try this after this session, just as an example of something, how easy and how powerful it is. And I'm trying to prep you and give you enough time to think about this. You know where I'm going with this. Is there something you'd say, go try this right now, go to hit this website. This is a massive resource. What is one thing that you could go tell, tell everyone if they want to get their feet wet immediately after this to go play with? What would that be? I think it, it sounds so basic, right? I, years ago, I had a, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor that told me that the advanced stuff is usually just the basics done very well and at the right time. <laughs> and it sounds so basic, but just getting good and efficient with Google searches and then something as simple as Google Alerts. If you just think of how powerful Google Alerts is, you know, when I was um, developing the SEC 497 course for months, I, I couldn't really talk about it publicly. And so I would actually set up Google Alerts for keywords about that class and just, hey, if you see any mention of this on the internet, fire me an email because I want to know no one should be talking about this. And so people think of, um, you know, like, oh, sensitive information going out there and how are you even supposed to know about that? just thinking of key alerts like hey what certain you know i've done it before even for like executives for once again public and private sector but combinations of like their names the street that they live on maybe their phone number and setting up these alerts so if that information ends up on the internet that you hear about it first right and that was one of the things that i was tasked with in the government right when the uh when you get these key, key kind of figures in the public eye that start getting protests at their house, right? And I was the one who was tasked with basically, hey, if there's gonna be a protest at this person's house, they wanna hear about it from us, not when their wife's calling, letting them know that there's a protest at their house. And so just some of these alerts, these almost for lack of a better term, trip wires that we can set up to where when people start talking about these sensitive information, we get a hit. And so something, like I said, as simple as setting up a few Google alerts to see if your sensitive information is out there is so quick and simple and free. Well, it's also, you know, it's also from a corporate perspective, um, brand, in addition to, you know, social engineering stuff, a lot of people 
forget this, that a lot of corporations forget about, uh, you know, how crucial their brand is. And from a legal side, having OSN be scanning to see if anyone is using your brand or selling your product illegally or potentially representing your brand um, on a different website, that kind of stuff I've seen a lot of corporations really invest heavily and they don't even consider it cybersecurity. They just, they consider part of legal enforcement of IP. You know, do you, do you have, you know, any comments on that, you know, where you've been involved in any of those kind of cases? More than I care to talk about. You know, absolutely more than I care to talk about to uh, to kind of run down. You know, it's said in there too, kind of like um, a- analyzing public infrastructure. And once again, that's something that I've done quite a bit, the merger and acquisition due diligence, right? Large company getting ready to buy a smaller company. And the smaller company says, here's all the infrastructure that we have. It's never accurate, right? And it's not that they're trying to hide stuff. It's just never accurate, right? People don't have a good idea of what's out there. And then the sensitive information, absolutely, right? So many times it's... um. When you're kind of doing a post-mortem when some place gets hacked and you're trying to go back and figure out what that initial infection point was and there was one time last year when it was basically the uh, the most likely way that the attackers got in there with this organization ended up believing was that someone on one of these jobs boards it was basically an unintentional malicious insider just giving out talking about what they do on a day in day out basis and giving away a very detailed description of their technical stack and unintentionally laying out a game plan for an attacker to come in and compromise them. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's, it's one of those questions. It's actually a very good question that I I love asking is technical people is, you know, monitoring what people are saying about your organization. Obviously that's important for public relations. Obviously that's important for HR, but this is important for technical people. And more and more now I see the technical people going absolutely because in their lives and their careers, they've run into instances when that actually was key, right? Because you're the one who has to deal with it. You know, there's a, um, uh, I'm going to, pitch a webcast that I think you should do because I think it'd be very popular beyond just the cybersecurity community. But um, OSN for dating, if you think about that for a second, it's like I was in just in a conversation, um, I was talking to a friend of mine who was talking about, you know, trying to validate, you know, people they're about to meet online and then they get their phone number and they they went through this entire thing about, I look up their phone number, I do this background check, I'm going to meet this person out. And I said, you know what you're doing? And they said, no, I said, that's open source intelligence. And they're like, well, that sounds kind of, you know, like, you know, iffy, you know, but I I really feel I need to protect myself. But, you know, even just doing a basic webcast on, you know, hey, if you're going and meeting a person for the first time, online dating, anything, here's some things you could easily do to, uh, you know, help protect yourself. You know, I think, you know, the average individual out there would like everyone should watch this, you know, just just in case, because this is something that is used for good, but it also be used, you know, as some people putting in the comments there for social engineering, for profiling, you know, and, and so forth. But, you know, anyways, I'm just going to drop that webcast. If, if in the comments, if people want that webcast, you know, throw it in there saying we want a webcast on how to how to do uh, proper background <laughs> investigations on someone I'm about to meet from an online dating app. Um, because this is the kind of thing, ever, this touches everyone, just like forensics, you know, it's one of these things is when you start showing people, like even on your iPhone, like the you know uh, frequent locations that uh, iPhone's tracking, you know people's eyes just go pop. You mm-hmm. know? So let's talk about um, your course real quick. You know, so it's a new course, even though Sans has been doing OSINT for a while. Um, what is new about this course? What is you know, exciting about it? What you know, someone comes into this course. What are some three key things we're going to walk away with um, even- when they walk out? Walk out. Yeah, even the name, just practical open source intelligence, right? Like I, I have, once again, over 20 years with the uh, the U.S. government, a lot of experience with the intelligence community, with law enforcement, also the private sector as well. But a lot of people don't realize this. You do. My wife, actually, she was one of the early employees at CrowdStrike, and she ran cyber threat intelligence for a Fortune 100. And so obviously kind of helping out with that, kind of all working together, it leaves me with a very, very well-rounded perspective in how different people across all public and private sectors are uh, are using OSINT to the problems that they run into. And that's what the class is. The class is just problems that we've run into and this is how we solved them, right? It's so funny. It's uh, I get the comments sometimes of the labs, you know, the infrastructure that we've set up and go through it and I try to make them to have a good time. And I get comments all the time like, oh my God, you're so creative. And it's like, no, I'm not. 
like this is all things that have happened to me like for pretty much every lab in the class like like we can sit there and i can tell you exactly what the story was behind that it's just a real world problem and this is how we've solved it and so i think that's been the big focus right it's a um it's a focus on this is what we're doing this week but monday next week when you go back to work like immediately you can start applying these things and that's a big point of it right and it's just really taking the time to not just introduce people to concepts but talking about how it's helped me out like how this is applied to me to help them realize how they can use it as well too and then to have all these hands-on labs that they can give them a chance to kind of see how they can have success with it so Tell me about one of the more exciting labs that they do in my class. <laughs> one of the more exciting labs. Uh, well, there was one, it's kind of funny, once again, right? The advanced stuff, just the uh, basics done very, very well. And there's something that I uh, kind of jokingly refer to as big bounty, right? When someone reaches out to an organization and says, hey, I found a vulnerability, pay me. Right. They don't, if an organization doesn't have a bug bounty program, right? Kind of set up to do that. And it's, um, something that I kind of help out with a lot because they always send anonymous email addresses. You can't kind of trace them down. You can't do anything like that. And this, once again, it's so simple, but I remember this was about a year ago and reviewing one of these emails that came in that was trying to basically kind of blackmail this company to pay them a vulnerability. And they ended the email with a very kind of thinly veiled threat. And it was something along the lines of like, well, we'll see how this works out for you. You know, not my problem, but that's, you know, that's the way the cookie crumbles. But they didn't say the saying just like you would expect a normal person to say in English. It was slightly off. Like if I say, oh, that's the way the cookie crumbles. If I say that's the way the Oreo crumbles, we all know what I'm talking about. It's kind of the same sentiment, but it's not the way we would say it. And so we're looking at this email and my wife's looking at this and she's like, this person's not a native English speaker. And I'm like, what? Not a native English speaker. It's like, oh yeah, I, I, I guess you're right. And took that unique saying that they said, searched it on the internet and got one hit. And the one hit was from a Twitter profile of someone who was a web security, like an independent web security researcher, bug bounty hunter based out of the Netherlands. Right. And so something just as stupid as identifying something unique and then searching for it and finding it tied to one person. Like I said, that's we cover like, you know, a lot of technical stuff and researching IPv6 addresses to see if get, they're tied to wireless and all these technical things, too. But that's just such a basic example where there's kind of a thought process and a methodology of going through to find out what was going on. So. It's, a, it's very valid. You know, one of my first investigations I was involved in when OSI was very similar. There was a hacker that used a drop site um, that was named, you know, something really stupid, you know, as a, as a back end where they're uh, secure copying all their files to. You looked up that domain and, of course, the domain was registered is like, you know, at 31337 Excel, you know, Connecticut or something like that. But I got the IP address and I did reverse on the IP address and it ended up being a cable modem. And I was like, Eureka, and I was like the guy, the guy set up his drop site as his home. <laughs> what? Oops. And based on that, we got subscriber information. And there was like all these ties, you know, to that, the name of the site, to his hacker handle and everything else. The, uh, within that information being provided, uh, OSI agents and FBI agents were uh, uh, storming uh, within 48 hours. Uh, nice. Sam. Nice. Was, so one more story is uh, another one's kind of incorporated in there. And I was, it was, this was during COVID and getting a phone call, they were uh, looking for an international fugitive and they had subpoenaed from uh, their email provider and had the last few IP addresses that they had checked their email address from. So I'm researching them and like kind of, you know, and basically the place where they've been traveling over the past couple of weeks and no one knew where this person was. And I kind of the most recent IP address came back to an island and I'm sitting there and I'm like, no indication of a VPN, you know, looking at Shodan, looking at census, like no indication VPN. I'm like, God, this, this actually seems like it, it's pretty legit. And then when I started to, well, once again, using like census Shodan to start looking at certificates associated with that IP space and just realizing like, wait a second, like okay, this IP address is tied to a hotel chain, right? It was a European-based hotel chain. And I looked up and that hotel chain did have a hotel on the island. 
And so, so many times over my career, I felt like I was Captain Buzzkill. Just people get excited. <laughs> we found the criminal. They're in Germany. It's like, no, they're not using VPN. No, they're not. They're doing this. And with this, I told them, like, I think they're right there. And they went back to the country and they came back and they're like, no, the country says they never came into the country. And I'm like, I'm like wincing as I say it. I'm like, I stand by what I said. And about two days later, that was on a Thursday, I think. And then it was that Saturday or Sunday, that weekend, I got a, a phone call and said, hey, we just let you know we caught the fugitive. I'm like, beautiful. Where were they? They're like, exactly where you said they were. Yeah, it's like, it was like Billy Madison when he run the second grade spelling bee, like, I'm the smartest man alive. <laughs> and it's like, no, I was just using census and Shodan and MaxMind and just kind of a solid methodology, right? But that's an example of people are like, okay, yeah, Shodan, Roger, that I understand that. Okay, census, that's another one. Cool. But how can we actually apply this? Right? How can we actually use this to help us out to solve the mysteries? Forensics and OSINT are so similar. People have no idea. You're solving mysteries. You're trying to figure out what happened. It's just a matter of, are you getting the information from like a phone or a device, an image that you have, or are you getting the information from the internet? But it's just so similar in the methodologies in so many ways. So we're going to throw up our last poll because you kind of touched on something there that, you know, mentioning Germany and international is that obviously with OSINT, there's a lot of debate considering privacy and public information online and to be able to remove yourself from, you know, uh, well-known sources online. Uh, so I'm kind of curious from the uh, community's perspective here, OSN privacy often conflict, write out a few words that concern you about the capabilities of OSN. Um, it's a little bit, you know, harder one, but again, you know, tying back to you, you know, where do you, you know, think that, you know, these countries and, you know, regions of the world, the EU, and um, with the compliance uh, mechanisms, is, is the ship sailed? Is legal going to be able to keep up with trying to maintain privacy or is it you know what do you think at this point when if you're advising any of these uh lawmakers about what this means if you're testifying in court no. uh you know congress or anything like that you know what would you say is it is it like it's done you can't do anything about it or is hey here's some recommendations where do you stand there are recommendations that you can make and that's always a question that you get especially towards the end of the class of people realizing how much is out there and like what can you do to kind of redact it you know and there are some strategies but also at some point it's I, um, my personal belief is you got to live your life right it's I, I personally like i i don't worry about it too much i try not to do dumb stuff but some people kind of take it to the uh, the extreme right to really protect everything and it's you end up setting up trusts and technically you don't own your house that's owned by a trust that's you know owned by a panda bear in the cincinnati zoo and so you can kind of take that but on a large scale right yeah it's it doesn't really make things go away it just changes things right like we look at gdpr you know, some of those European data privacy laws and now everywhere across the world is kind of using that as the base more and more. And you see some places, even like, you know, California taking it a little bit further with their privacy laws. And it may change things, but it doesn't really get rid of things, right? If you look at who is, who is data used to be amazing. You know, you were just talking about who is, and now who is, is basically a dumpster fire, right? You try to do who is on something and it's just going to be private. Well, does that mean that it's gone? You know, GDPR and some of these other things killed it? No, it just means we're not using who is as much anymore. We're using historic who is data, right? And that kind of becomes valuable. So it's not so much that it kind of fixes things or makes things go away. Some of these privacy laws, it just changes how we have to do things right and you adjust and OSINT is constant adjustment right look at Twitter right now and everything you know I was talking uh, about two weeks ago to a buddy of mine who's the head of development for a big cyber threat intelligence and kind of a OSINT dark web monitoring firm and he said that they came to the decision that they just basically 10 3 Twitter for right now they're not worrying about it because he got tired of having his developers spend three days doing something and then undoing it two days later Right, or having to yeah. read you it a week after that. And so, yeah, this OSINT itself is just constant adjustment. And so as these things pop up, you just be like, you know, when, when Facebook, when they changed, took the graph search and a lot of that away, right? You just don't kind of pack up and say, okay, well, I guess we're not looking at Facebook anymore. You adjust. Me personally, I'll pour myself a drink and then I'll start playing around with things and figuring out, okay, what do we still have, right? Where do we go from here to make this work? So, and that just comes from, I think, um, you know, when I first started doing this style of work, I was told, like, we have no budget, no budget for equipment, no budget for training, no budget. And it sounds like a joke, and it kind of is, and it kind of isn't. But one nice thing about having no budget is it makes your decisions very, very easy. 
right? If yeah. you have, if there's a capability that you want and you don't have it, you can't afford it and it's not free, you either build it yourself or you do without it. And coming from that mindset of just having like, okay, solve these problems myself as really at the time it was very frustrating, but it set me up very well to understand how things work and what's important. And just realizing that, yeah, we can adjust, we can figure this out. So we're gonna close up this segment real quick, but you know, like tying into your last statements about the privacy stuff, there's um, there's a couple Instagram and uh, TikTok uh, profiles that I follow, and they get these challenges where people say, they, "Where am I?" Because you know, most of the geotagging and I, you know, uh, G, you know, GPS coordinates are removed from pictures these days, but they do a really good job. It's like, "Hey, where am I?" And they just quickly scan their phones, like a 10 second thing, and then. They are able to take landmarks like a water tower, a Wendy's, a CVS, her, you know, dialect and said, I think that's in the South. They write a program to say, where is a Wendy's, a water tower, you know, in this all within 500 meters. And then the sun mm -hmm. the direction and there's a road and then they're able to find it within 10 minutes. So here's exactly where you're standing. You know, that kind of stuff. I'm sitting there like, oh, you know, it just, you know, the amount of capabilities out there, what you're able to just pull from a video or a picture is hands down amazing. And so mm -hmm. it's a fantastic skill set to have and never we never get wrong with it the, some so, of the um, things that i see on social media like twitter with the russia ukraine and other parts of the world you're seeing analysis of imagery that less than a decade ago you would never see outside of a classified briefing yeah you're seeing like things like i said even like literally less than a decade ago you would never see that quality of work in a classified briefing and now it's just someone on twitter just analyzing the imagery and what's going on this is like it's mind boggling. it is yeah, yeah. You know, that when they're, especially fake fake news, if there's a picture and they said this is going on in Ukraine right now, I was like that. Now that's because <laughs> I could stand. I heard that's a picture without not even yeah. anywhere near Ukraine. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna uh, we'll come back, Matt, because I, the question I want you to come back and end with is: if you're just getting started in OSINT, you know, are there books? What kind of resources? What should you do? And you know, you know, final thoughts. You know, for those people who just want to get started and get their feet wet into this. So we'll come back right at the end, the last couple of minutes to close out. But in the meantime, I want to introduce John Hubbard, who is a personal great friend of mine and a leader of our cyber defense and the Blueprint Podcast. Who's going to be talking about the new season that is going to be coming out. So John, uh, come on board and tell us what all about Blueprint. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, you know we've talked SOPs and plans and playbooks and all this preparation stuff right now let's move into the uh, the detection and analysis so the moment comes where that alert goes off and you're starting to think yep this might be the real thing and this is going to be a pretty serious deal um, as an analyst right do you do you jump into action there like where do you start on the activity I, I know Kat you had some um, thoughts on this you wanted to share that you had mentioned before we uh, started recording here yeah, well, I mean, I guess what I'm passionate and actually Carson's passionate about this, we might have argued this passionately before, I don't know. But um, before you take any action whatsoever, make sure you've really fully scoped and uh, gathered all the analysis possible. Because what I've seen over and over, lessons learned, is that you think you've gotten the adversary, you've gotten them out, you go and you take action and suddenly they're back in there again. Because if you don't get all of the instances of where an adversary may be, they're just going to come right back in or they never left to begin with. So yeah, before you act. Yeah, so you're, you're right. I would say one of the things I would even before even that one of the things that we often see early in incidents is that it's gotten big and we haven't applied our usual sock processes to however big, big that is in time. And then people start going off in different directions and they're like, Oh, I've got to go do the thing. And that incident commander, whatever you're calling them, and that incident structure hasn't yet shown up. And that's actually one of the most vulnerable stages that the entire, entire enterprise is, is in, is in between the time of, oh my God, I found a thing, to we're running this as a major incident. Yeah, and I can't under understate the amount of pressure people are under when they're doing incident response to act, just fix it, yeah. just fix it. And, and the pressure is immense. If you haven't done it before, you'll you'll experience it the first time. There's something really bad. Why didn't you do anything yet? It's it's because we don't know that we've gotten it all. We don't know that we've seen everything. We're still analyzing. And analysis takes longer than a minute. It takes longer than an hour usually, depending on how big the incident is. is. It could take days, sometimes weeks. So it's very uncomfortable for leaderships and incident responders alike to to encounter that pressure of just fix it. You know? Right. 
Yeah. Um, could you just talk a little more about uh, that moment when, you know, it has started? Like, what are the actual things that people are doing to convince them that they're like, okay, now I've got it all. Like, how do you know that you have enough to then actually start jumping into the, the blocking and the containment and all that other stuff? Well, the first thing I'll talk about is following various threads. So as you're, let's yeah. just talk about a root compromise because these things all differ. It depends on what it is, right? But if you're talking about a root compromise and trying to figure out how many, you know, uh, systems, virtual machines, environments are affected, um, you follow threads, right? You start with one and you trace it to, to where they may have, uh, you know, infiltrated something else. If there was lateral movement, you know, this is where the kill chain comes in handy and you can just kind of follow along. Oh, here's where they were looking. Here's where they were taking some data out. Here's where they moved to another system through a legitimate account. So that's some of it, right? Is trying to figure out what's legitimate versus what's not legitimate. So following threads is the first step. Um, yeah, one, one of my colleagues has a, a phrase he uses, which is, where did it come from? Where did it go? <laughs> and if you can answer those questions, then you've got a pretty good handle on what's actually happened. But if you have something that happened and you don't know where it came from, you don't have confidence that there wasn't something else that had happened from that. And if you don't know where it went to, you don't know if it's ended. And so it's, it is that kill chain, but that's a real shorthand that we always use. If you can't answer those two questions, you don't know the full scope of what's going on. And by the way, yeah, I completely agree with that. Uh, finding that initial entry point is one of the toughest things there is. That is actually, if you found that in entry point, you've got gold because then Absolutely. you can really track it, but that's hard um, to do. We, and we often use the term patient zero yeah. um, or the initial infection vector or whatever. I'll offer two points here. One of them is, is that um, that process of pulling those threads going left and right in time establishing the left goal post and the right goal post of the adversary and bubbling that all up um is is tremendously important in incident um the one of the best terms i've heard um stolen from the military is a common operating picture meaning a shared situational awareness by all participants of the incident um about what we know has happened in a succinct manner that you know, everybody can understand. And um, having that comp is important. And to this date, um, you know, everyone's, everyone often asks, you know, how do you put together your comp for a major incident? And quite frankly, um, the best and enduring answer I've heard is a directed graph that mm -hmm. describes the major aspects of what the adversary is doing um, that are usually historically would be depicted on a whiteboard, usually scribbled out in haste. And today, because of our work from home and hybrid work nature, usually get scribbled out in something in electronic form. Critically, they must not be what I'll refer to is as bug splats or dandelions, meaning graphs that are so complex, you can't look at it on one screen. It's That's already too much. Um, and so, so one of the things we think about in that incident is, is which of those parties we discussed is responsible for maintaining and updating that that cop. One of the things I really like about the Blueprint podcast is I, I, when I, I have to drive all around Denver and I always put the thing on um, and it says subscribe and it always shows up at the top of my playlist in Spotify. Um, and uh, I just put it on and, you know, John does, is hands down one of the best interviewers we have here at Sands. Um, and he is able to pull out information and keep things engaging, fun, and also very educational. Um, I'm always learning something new uh, from the Blueprint podcast, and um, I've been on it in the past. I think Matt, you've been on it. The the hands down, it's a great resource, and the new season is just incredible. If you've not subscribed yet, please do it. Um, and also the uh, the Blue Team Summit's actually going on right now too. So if you you want more of that, you could head over to the uh, Cyber Defense Summit. You know, look look for the Cyber Defense Blue Team Summit that's online right now. And you could switch over and uh, go all day long uh, to uh, listening to John and uh, uh, a bunch of speakers that's going on. So Matt, I'm actually speaking there later this afternoon. We're going to talk about uh, cloud breaches. We're going to talk a little bit about right. uh, dealing with cloud breaches and then using OSINT to run it down. So I'm pulling double duty. So I'm going very, you're very popular nice today. shirt, then T-shirt, then nice collared shirt again. Yeah, very popular today. All right. So closing, closing now. If you're just getting started in OSINT, you know, what do you do? Are there books? A couple of people asked a question in there about, is there anything on, have you written a book? 
you know, like what is what is your advice? What is your one takeaway you want everyone to? Walk yeah, away I wrote from? I wrote six of them. They come with the Sands class. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like, uh, I know Ray Baker just wrote a book that I have a copy of. I haven't had a chance to actually read it yet, but I, I'm sure that's fantastic. You know, Michael Bazell always comes out with the OSINT books and does a good job. I think the biggest one is really to uh, to just get involved with the community. You know, years ago, you realize, like, with especially with me trying to pay attention to forensics, with pen testing offensive stuff, with OSINT, there's too much. There's constantly going on. You can't keep track of everything. And so in a lot of ways, I really kind of outsource that to Twitter. I just there's certain people that I follow on Twitter and I just assume that if something is important in that space, I'm going to hear about it. Right. And we have that with OSINT too, right? If you're following like uh, one of my uh, fellow SANS instructors and good friend, Nico Deckens, Dutch OSINT guy, yeah. you know, if something's important in that space, he's going to tweet out about it. There's someone named uh, Sector 35 that does an amazing job coming out with this week in OSINT where they basically go through and gather blog posts or different videos or kind of a, that were new that week that they thought were really useful for OSINT and puts that out there. And so just following a few key people and paying attention to those resources just to keep an eye on what's new. And just once again, think about how you can incorporate these things into your daily life, right? There's so many times I hear people say like, oh, I don't really have experience. Like, but, but like I said, there's ways that you can incorporate this into your daily life. Right. Okay, so favor um, and in the uh, producers in the back, if you could put up Matt's Twitter handle real quick um, while we're ch chatting about this. Matt, oh, you mentioned a lot of uh, people to follow on Twitter. Can you put out a tweet immediately following this and saying, here are the people, here's this community you should follow, um, you know, your must follow list for OSN. And that way, for everyone who's listening right now or coming in later, yep. they'll be able to find this tweet, maybe make it a pinned tweet or something like that um, for a little bit of time. That way, there's this resource that people could go to, you know, maybe post on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, Absolutely. That would be there. Um, that would be, I don't know if you started an OSN Discord or LinkedIn community, but maybe that would be helpful to you, you know, as this is definitely growing at this point. Yep. No, it's uh, definitely working on it, trying to build up that community. Like I said, working with Nico and we'll, we'll get there. We're getting it going, but uh, it's just exciting right now, right? There's all this change, but that's part of the, uh, I think that's part of the appeal for a lot of us, right? Why we like it is you, you never know everything. Things are always new. Things are always changing and it kind of forces you to be on top of your game. All right, my friend. Um, I can't wait to see you again. Uh, get another big bear hug from you. Uh, you know, coming up which, soon. You know, coming up soon. People stand in line for. Um, thank you again for everything you're doing uh, in the community, uh, your expertise, what you've done for uh, the government in the past, um, all everything you've done up until this point, you know, in being on our show today. Uh, thanks again. Uh, for everyone else, uh, this is this week's uh, Wait, Just, and InfoSec. I really appreciate you uh, tuning in. This uh, stream happens every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, uh, so again, put it in your calendar, subscribe to it, and it's also recorded and put online as well uh, so you can listen to it after the fact. Um, I'm glad everyone was able to join today. My name is Rob Lee. I'm the Chief Curriculum Director here at the Sands Institute and appreciate your time. Thank you very much and see you next time. So my name is Mackenzie Morris, and currently I'm a senior industrial consultant for Dragos. And during my first job as um, a process controls engineer, I came to find that chemical engineering was not the career for me. I pivoted into system administration for uh, Emerson Delta V, and like cybersecurity fell into my responsibilities. And my manager sort of just sent me to Sans SecWest 2018. Uh, where I took Sec 401 with uh, Brian Simon. I just like fell in love with cybersecurity like immediately. And I would like immediately started to think like, how could I come back and take more? How could I do this the most efficient way? Um, I, I always would tell people to take courses in person if you can, just because there's such a different experience sort of being like in the same place at the same time, because there's a lot of education that can take outside of, you can take on outside of the classroom. Um, and if you go to one of these SANS courses and you're not taking the time to approach the instructor or your classmates, like you're missing out on a lot of the value because there's so much to learn from just casual conversation with people. And there's so many stories to hear about people's experiences in, uh, you know, in cybersecurity or in your industry, especially if you're in a subspecialty. Um, there's just so much to learn from both your classmates and your instructors. Mm -hmm.